Well, good morning, Cornerstone family. It's a great morning, and I'm excited. Today we're wrapping up the book of Proverbs. This has been a very exciting study throughout the summer, and if you have not picked up one of these uh, devotional booklets through the book of Proverbs, we still have a few left. So it's the book of Proverbs plus four different commentaries, lots of questions for you to go deeper into God's Word and apply it in your personal life. Well, we've looked at how to have a better relationship at home with our marriages. We've learned how to have better friendships. We've learned a lot on our finances, how God's Word gives us direction on that. Well, today, we're going to be looking at the topic of becoming a better leader. Now, you may be thinking, well, I'm not really much of a leader. Um, I'm more of a follower. Well, the truth is, we're all leaders. We all have influence in someone else's life, whether it's at home, at work, or maybe at school, your friend group. We all influence one another. Uh, John Maxwell made this statement, and I think it's a pretty good statement. It it may be a little simplistic, but it's a great uh, description of leadership. He said, leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. We all have influence in relationships. And so, The big question today is, how can I become a better leader at home, at work, with your friends, at school? How can we become better leaders? Proverbs 1, 3 has been our remember verse. This has been our guiding light here. Uh, The purpose, the purpose of Proverbs is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. Now, we all want to be successful, so that means we need to be disciplined, So our big idea is this, if I want success in my life, I must create habits that support my commitments. Well, what are the habits that will help us become good leaders, wise leaders? And as I've been studying through the book of Proverbs, I came up with only only 30 plus different uh, uh, Proverbs on helping us become better leaders. And uh, my wife said, nope. And, and so I pared it down to 20, and she said, nope. Pared it down to 16, she said, nope, let me look at it. And, and she helped me come down to the top 10. So we're going to do the top 10, kind of Letterman style, the top 10 uh, truths that will help us become better leaders from the book of Proverbs. So we'll start with 10, and we'll go down to one being the most important. Number 10, wise leaders keep their egos in Check. Now, have you ever had your ego get you into trouble? Has your pride ever got you there? Okay, me more than once. Um, I remember when Karen and I were dating, and and you know we were both very athletic at the time, um, and I just said, you know what? Whatever you can do, I can do better. All right, I'm gonna eat those words, right? In fact, I will do double whatever you can do. And she goes, double? And I go, yeah, why not? So she got down and did 75 push-ups. I don't do push-ups well back then or even now, you know. (laughs) It was like, oh, goodness, 75. So how many? That's 150. Oh, no. Okay, so I did 150 push-ups. I Seriously, after 50, she was saying, you don't have to do this. Really, you don't have to do this. After 75, she goes, that's good, that's good. And I'm like, no. I mean, I was shaking, I was sweating. But I did 150 push-ups. Yes, I did. And then then she goes, okay, what's next? And I'm going, next? (laughs) She did 75 sit-ups. I'm like, oh, oh, no. (laughs) Uh, 150 put uh, setups. Yes, I did. I did that, and and oh man, it was like the longest, most painful day of my life. Um, I ate my words. Definitely, uh, keep your ego in check. Proverbs 16:18 says this: Pride goes before destruction, and haughtiness before a fall. <laughs> oh, so true, so true. Uh, Proverbs 27:21 says this. Fire tests the purity of silver and gold. Well, you know, you got to heat it up, take off the impurities. But then it says this, but a person is tested by being praised. Yeah, don't let your head swell up. You make sure you get through the doorway, right? All right, uh, wise leaders, uh, number 10, keep their egos in check. Number nine, wise leaders foresee danger and take precaution. 
Why do you see danger? Take precaution. Now, right now, as a church and the leaders, we're looking at different things that we've kind of deferred maintenance that we need to take a look at. And so looking down the road, three months, six months, we want to take care of some of these things that we've pushed off for the last couple of years. We have two roofs that need to be uh, re-roofed. They are at the end of life. Uh, we've gotten more than we should have expected out of these roofs. God has blessed us, but it's time to do them before the rain comes, right? So wise leaders, they, they're able to see uh, into the future, see what needs to be done. Look down and make a plan. Uh, look down the road. So Proverbs 22 verse 3 says this, A prudent person foresees danger and takes precaution. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequence. Be aware, count the cost. Now, I, I also want to add to this because I, I think sometimes we overanalyze and we get analysis paralysis, right? You know, it's like, ah, I got to make a decision, you know, whether there's, there's a ton of different things that need to be done. And right now, we, we have a ton of things from parking lot to roofs to things for kids ministry, youth ministry. There's a lot of things that need to be done. But we need to move forward on all of these. And so we've made a plan. Um, Proverbs 14.4, I thought this goes very well with this. Without oxen, a stable stays clean. Now, I know you don't have a stable. At least most of us don't. <laughs> um, the kings do, I guess, you know, right? Um, but we're looking at, we like everything clean and orderly and neat, Right? But then you're not doing any work. You're not getting anything done. Look what the rest of it says. But you need a strong ox for a large harvest. So to get things done, to get big things done, it may be messy. But you can see through that and you can see the reward. And that's wise leadership. You foresee danger. You take precautions. You make decisions. Number eight. A wise leader is surround themselves with wise advisors. You need people around you that will give you wisdom, to help you when you're, when you're struggling to make a decision. Now, we have an elder board and a deacon board for the church. We have elders that they're the decision makers, but the deacons are servant leaders, and so we like to get people's opinions, and, and we go to our servant leaders and say, hey, what do you think about this? What's your opinion on this? Uh, and it's great to get the wisdom uh, and counsel from several different leaders before you make decisions. That way you keep on path. Uh, Proverbs 15, 22. Plans go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. So who do you go to when you need wisdom, when you need to make some decisions? Now, as, as far as the church, I mentioned the elders and deacons. Um, in personal, my personal life, I have four men that I love to go to when there are tough decisions. When I'm having difficulty making a decision, I, I go to these men and, and I ask their advice. I value them. I hope you have people in your life that you can ask advice for your business, for your family, for direction in life. So wise leaders surround themselves with wise advisors. That's number eight. And number seven, wise leaders outlast their critics. Now, this is, this is very important. Um, this has made a difference in my life. I, I started here in 1985, and in 1986, I wanted to quit about three or four times. <laughs> in fact, uh, there was times in the first couple of years here in ministry, my wife begged me to quit. You can ask her. Um, but I learned this. I learned this principle that I will be where God has called me until God calls me somewhere else. I, I won't leave because it's hard. I won't leave because I've been discouraged. And that happens. <laughs> um, you got to outlast your critics. I, I really didn't learn this principle until later on in ministry, but this principle is so good. Proverbs 12, verse 16 says this, A fool is quick-tempered, but a wise person stays calm when insulted. We're going to be in, in our lives, in our ministries, in your workplace, at your work. You're going to have people that are your fans. 
they'll encourage you. They'll, they'll give you some good encouragement and they'll like what you do and then they'll give you the thumbs up and that'll help keep you moving forward. But you will also have people in your life at work or in your um, family that will criticize you. They'll see everything as negative. <laughs> and when you have a good win, they'll, they'll think, oh, no, no. <laughs> and it's just like Eeyore, right? You have to stay calm when you're insulted. And it's hard. So I'm going to ask you, how well do you do in this area? A quick-tempered uh, a fool is quick-tempered, but a wise person stays calm when insulted. An honest witness tells the truth. A false witness tells lies. Some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. I want to be on that healing side, not the cutting remarks. Truthful words stand the test of time, but lies are soon exposed. And, and so I, I've learned that God eventually, he'll bring the tr truth to the surface There'll be people that will lie about you, people that will criticize you and tell, you know, gossip, whatever. But trust God to bring the truth to the surface. He will in time. Now, I, I think uh, as Christians, it, it breaks my heart when I see Christians criticizing and throwing insult at other Christians, especially Christian leaders. It's like we're devouring our own <laughs> And yet, we don't know the whole truth. We gotta be careful of that. We don't wanna be on the side that is cutting people down. We wanna be the encouragers. And if you've been hurt and you've been criticized on, you know, in a way that has not been fair, that has not been accurate, you know, I'm so sorry. I pray that healing words will come your way. I pray that you'll be encouraged, uh, that God will lift you up. So truth will come to the truth, to the, to the surface. So uh, wise leaders, they, number seven, they outlast the critics. Number six, wise leaders help create growth. Help create growth. And so if you manage a coffee uh, bistro, you want to create growth, right? If you manage Home Depot, you want to create growth. If, if you're a manager somewhere or, you, or you're a CEO or a CFO, you want to create growth. Well, as a church, we want to create growth, but what is our guiding light in the growth that we want to create? What is our vision that directs us in the growth that we want to create? For us, it's helping people find and follow Jesus. So that directs everything we do. Now, how can we grow? We can grow in many different ways. One area is to grow numerically, right? We want more people going to church. We want more people uh, coming to church and beginning a relationship with Jesus and growing in that relationship. What's another area of growth? Well, we want people this year, we've been talking about relationships, right? We want people to grow in relationships. We want people to start to develop relationships of other Christians in their life that will encourage them in their faith. Well, what's another area of growth? One of our purposes is to grow personally with life application. That as we grow closer to the Lord, it blesses our family. Well, that's another area of growth. There's lots of areas of growth we want to grow in. And so in every business, this is, I hope, is your goal. Proverbs 14, 26. A growing population is a king's glory. A prince without subject has nothing. So if you're trying to lead and there's no one following you, you're not growing, right? But it's not always just in numbers. It's also quality. It's physically, it's spiritually, financially, it's outreach. It's in relationships. Number five, a wise leader wants to create healthy boundaries with the opposite Sex. This is really important. We talked a little bit about this last week. I want to go a little bit deeper here. For our ministry, and I, I'm sure for your work, uh, your work ethics and all, there are boundaries, healthy boundaries. For us, it's pink on pink and blue on blue, right? And, and so if I need to counsel a woman, I bring somebody in there with me. I have my wife on the phone. If I can't do that, you know, I, I find a way so that there is safety that we can have healthy relationships and help people grow. Um, 
that's in youth ministry, that's in children's ministry, that's in every ministry. It, it's pink on pink, blue on blue. Uh, girls with girls, uh, boys with boys. We, we want to make sure that we stay safe and there's no false accusations able to be uh, given here. We've seen this in life. We've seen this in the Bible. I, I think of Solomon who wrote m- many of these Proverbs, right? He had many wives. That caused him many, many troubles <laughs> and hurt his life. I think about Samson and Delilah and the heartache and, and the destruction of his ministry. I, I think about David, King David, and then Bathsheba, his affair, and how it destroyed his ministry and the kingdom, and, and there was strife and enmity in his family. From that point on, God forgave him, but there were consequences. It's important that we have healthy boundaries with the opposite sex. Look at Proverbs 5, 8. Solomon speaking to his son, warning his son, stay away from her. Don't go near the door of her house. Keep a safe boundary. If you do, you will lose your honor and will lose to merciless people all you have achieved. It's very interesting how our culture will encourage you to do anything you want to do, as long as it makes you happy. And But as soon as you do, <laughs> the culture will turn on you and shame you. He's warning, you'll lose your honor. Strangers will consume your wealth, and someone else will enjoy the fruit of your labor. In the end, You'll groan in anguish when disease consumes your body. And then he says, I have come to the brink of utter ruin, and now I must face public disgrace. So what are your protocols to keep healthy boundaries with the opposite sex? Wise leaders, they create boundaries, healthy boundaries with the opposite sex. And wise leaders, number four, keep their hearts in check. Keep their hearts in check. Look at this Proverbs. Proverbs 4, 23. Guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. So if your heart is bitter, do you think that's going to affect the way you lead your family? Yeah. The way you lead your business? Absolutely. If your heart is full of greed, (laughs) That's going to direct your path, isn't it? It's important to check your heart. Is it full of pride? Is it coveting things that you can't afford? Is it full of lust? Your heart is going to direct your path. So check your heart. Good leaders, wise leaders, keep their hearts in check. And number three, wise leaders develop a good reputation with loyalty and kindness, loyalty and kindness. This is so important. Our culture really doesn't honor this, but this is important. The way you treat people, loyalty and kindness. This is so important. Um, my my kids, when they were preteens, around ten years old, they both wanted to date, <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, we can have this conversation when you're thirty-five." <laughs> We realized that this wasn't going to go away. And, and so we wanted to encourage them to be prepared for dating. So first we said, we're not going to have this discussion until you're 16. That'll be the earliest we have this discussion. But between now and then, we want you to really build up loyalty and kindness. These are characteristics that you should have in place When you start dating, you should be kind (laughs) and you should be loyal to your relationships. So the way you treat your teacher, the way you treat your coach, uh, the way you treat your friends, that doesn't go away when you start dating. (laughs) So you need to be loyal and you need to be kind. If your teacher is giving you an assignment before you go on a hangout with your friends, you need to do that assignment. And when you make a commitment to a friend, hey, you're going to go over to their house and hang out with them, if something better comes along, you don't just say, hey, shine you on, I'm going over here. No, 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 no. 
If you made a commitment, you stick with that commitment. Even if something better comes along, you know why? Something better will always come along. And if you want to be a good boyfriend or a good girlfriend, if you want to develop habits that will lead towards marriage in the future, loyalty and kindness is a good base. Look what he says here, Proverbs 3, verse 1. My child, never forget the things I have taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years, and your life will be satisfying. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people, and you will earn a good reputation, both with God and with people. Loyalty, kindness need to be the, the characteristic that we're known for. So good leaders, wise leaders, develop a good reputation with loyalty and kindness. And then number two, wise leaders keep their eyes on what's most important. What's most important? And I'll ask you this. What is most important for your life, your, your purpose in life, your, your desires in your life? What's most important? Is it the almighty dollar? Is it your 401 count? Building that up. Is it your vacation time? For me, for my family, it's family first. And that's one thing that I've tried to infuse in our culture here at Cornerstone. Family first. That's your first ministry. Now, did I always get that right? No, I didn't. Uh, my first seven years, I did not get it right. I put ministry first. And I thought I was honoring God because, man, look at all the Bible studies I'm teaching. Look at all the ministry that I'm doing. But I was absent from home. That's not of God. Read Deuteronomy chapter 6. That is not what God wants for us. First, you love God. You set the example, and then you lead your children in that path. So I encourage you. For us, ministry is first. That's what's most important. Look what he says here, Proverbs 4.25. Look straight ahead. Fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. Evil will always try to sidetrack you. For us, it's putting God first. And, and anywhere that you serve on this campus, whether it's on uh, staff, paid staff, or whether you're volunteering, if you ever need time to spend with your family, it's always a yes. Always a yes. Because family comes first. And if you get that right, if you honor your commitment with your spouse and your children and, and you honor your commitment with your parents, God will bless you in so many ways. So keep your eyes on what's most important. Don't get sidetracked. Proverbs 16, 9 says, we can plan, make our plans, but the Lord determines our step. Remember, God's blessing is so important. So keep your eyes on what's most important. And number one, wise leaders, answer to a higher authority. We answer to a higher authority. God is our authority. Above your boss, your, your C, CEO or CFO, God is your authority. For me, above the elders, God is my authority. And if I honor God and I do what is right before the Lord, his, his ways are the highest. Proverbs 9, verse 10 and 11 and 12, it says this, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Now, we don't have to fear the Lord for judgment because Jesus Christ has taken our judgment. But fear of the Lord also includes honoring him. It includes worshiping him. It's a, it includes, you know, making your plans to honor and, and revere him and his teachings that he's given us. 
Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Wisdom will multiply your days and add years to your life. If you become wise, you'll be the one to benefit. If you scorn wisdom, you'll be the one to suffer. So put God as your ultimate authority in your life. Because God, he tells us to love one another. He tells us to honor, value, appreciate, respect, to do the right thing. So which of these uh, truths for leadership do you need to embrace the most? And I'll just encourage you, either one or two, putting God as your authority or family first, That'd be my big challenge for you. But pray about where God is leading you. Let's pray together. Father God, we all have influence in our families. If we're going to school, we have influence with our teachers, with our fellow students, with our friends. Lord, we have influence at our work. Whether we're in charge or whether we're serving others, the way we treat people matters. Lord, help us to be loyal, to be kind to one another. Help us to keep our priorities right, that we would honor our families and love them and care for them, encourage them. Lord, you are our ultimate authority. And so as we're praying right now, if, if there's someone here that is watching online, listening online, or in, in our auditorium, Lord, that has not made that ultimate decision of inviting Christ to be Lord of their life, Lord, I pray that right now that they would make this decision to say yes to Jesus. And if that's the desire of your heart, you can pray along with me to say, Jesus, you are my ultimate authority. You're the King of kings and Lord of lords. And I understand your love for me is greater than I could ever know. That you love me so much that you took my sins, my shame, and my guilt, and you went to the cross, and you died in my place. You paid the penalty for my sins, my shame, and my guilt. And on the third day, you rose again from the grave. Jesus, I confess you as Lord of my life. That means I surrender to your authority. Help me now to follow you, to love you, to obey you the best I know how. It's in the powerful name of Jesus I pray. Amen. If you made a decision to follow the Lord today, please let me know. I'd love to pray for you, to encourage you. If you'd like a Bible to study God's Word, I'd love to encourage you in that. I also um, want to encourage you, we're going to start some small groups here in the month of October. So I'll be doing a family uh, small group. We'll be going through the sermon topic of each Sunday. We'll go deeper. And we're going to start the first Tuesday of October with a potluck here on campus in the cafe. So if you'd like to join us, please do. There'll be other small groups that will be available to you as well. I encourage you to develop some deeper relationships in our small groups. Let's now uh, continue to encourage one another. Until next week, God bless. <laughs>